Hello everyone, welcome to video three of Paleoecology, where we're going to be talking about niches, and in particular, how niches can be differentiated or are differentiated by animals. Um, so I think this is a really, really interesting topic um, to be looking at. So the key question here is how are niches differentiated? Niches are differentiated by something called niche partitioning. This can occur within ecosystems in a number of ways. And over the course of this video, I'm just going to explore some of the different ways in which um, organisms, animals, differentiate their niches. I say animals, but it's true of, uh, of all other organisms as well. So, you know, bear that in mind. In particular, um, I wanted to point out before I start that um, what's really nice and interesting about this niche space is that there is behavior to consider. So organisms, behavior can be part of that niche partitioning. And so that makes it this really nice complicated system that we can look at that has lots and lots of interesting things to tell us about both ecology and I think evolution. So there is a primary uh, kind of mechanism by which we may consider that many niches may be differentiated and that's called resource partitioning. Species use different resources and this can help them to coexist. Resources will usually mean food, i.e. what the things are eating, but it could also mean, for example, space. Our species could be living in different areas, different heights within a forest, within a single ecosystem, or in different spatial clusters. And a resource is essentially anything uh, like that, which is, um, which is uh, just, uh, an element of the uh, resources that are available to our group. One fine example was discovered on the Galapagos Islands, where there was a famous group of finches, about 20 species, that were um, caught and returned to the UK by Darwin on his famous voyage of the Beagle, where he was thinking about first geology and then about um, the transmutation of species. Interestingly, actually, um, he didn't realise the significance of the uh, finches that are now called Darwin's finches when he first collected them, and many of the insights they had to give us only occurred once they were studied by Darwin and colleagues once he had returned to the UK. Within this famous group of finches, there is a wide diversity in beak form and function. Finches with small beaks are more able to consume uh, small seeds, whilst finches with large beaks are better at consuming large seeds. It makes sense, right? And indeed, there are a range of adaptations within this group towards eating nuts, fruit, and insects. But what's really interesting about this is that all of these finches evolve from a common ancestor. So they evolve from a relatively, in geological terms, recent common ancestor. And they form an example of what we call, would call an adaptive radiation to different ecological niches. This common ancestor arrived on the islands uh, which these uh, finches now inhabit, um, were all very similar in form. And since they've arrived there, they have managed to create, or um, I guess take advantage of, different ecological niches based on resource partitioning. So that's pretty neat, pretty cool. Another cool example of niche partitioning is predator partitioning, which occurs when species are attacked differently by different predators. A really good example of this is the jansnal connell hypothesis, which explains tree biodiversity, which is high, in tropical rainforests. This uh, is thought to occur because host-specific herbivores or pathogens prevent any one species from dominating the landscape. So this is an example of a typical rainforest landscape, also co coincidentally drawn from the, uh, the first and best Predator movie, uh, Predator from the 1980s. So let's think about how this might work. If we have a tree species that becomes very, very common, um, we might expect that there would be a large number of predators, which would be host-specific, and um, preying on, say, the seedlings of that particular tree. And this means that the seedlings of that particular tree are less likely to survive because there are so many predators. The balance to that is that if our predators are host-specific and won't eat other tree species, if a given tree species becomes very rare, we would expect predators to struggle slightly because they, their, their food source is um, quite limited. Then for that tree, more predator-free areas would become available. 
and so a species' seedlings would then have a competitive advantage, and we may expect there to, to be more of those trees in the future. So this is a negative feedback that allows the tree species to coexist, and it can be classified as a stabilizing mechanism. And as I say, it's a really good example of predator partitioning and how this might explain um, the biodiversity that we see in tropical rainforests in terms of the uh, flora. We also have forms of conditional differentiation. This occurs when species differ in their competitive abilities based on, for example, varying environmental conditions. A nice example is a desert. So you can see one of these from Mad Max. Fury Road. Um, obviously, it's a bit dry. Indeed, that's the uh, premise of much of these uh, structure of the society as portrayed in this film. If you want to know more about it, you can ask in Zoom, but you may also want to watch the movie. But in a desert, we can expect there to be dry, drier years and wetter years. And we might expect some annual plants to be more successful during wet years and others more successful during dry years. As long as those two are interspersed, we can then expect the coexistence of those two, three, or however many species, because there are differences in conditions between years. There's also a form of this um, conditioning called temporal niche partitioning, which is based on um, time, right? So a really fantastic example of temporal niche partitioning can be found in the cicadas, which I'll get onto in a, in a second. But you can think about this more generally as a way to facilitate coexistence through avoidance of, for example, direct acoustic inf interference. Cicadas make noises at each other. Um, and if they have the same patterns of activity during the day, um, species will have to compete with each other. In contrast, if different animal species have taxon-specific activity patterns throughout the day, and that doesn't coincide, that will give them an advantage. So we may expect that to be evolutionary constrained, that behavior to be ev evolutionarily constrained to allow these um, species to coexist. So that's a, a fine example of temporal niche partitioning. Cicadas take that up to the next level. They're an extreme example because within this group, we see periodical cicadas, which have life cycles, which are really curious because they tend to focus in on prime numbers. So they will have life cycles that, for example, focus in on 13 or 17 years. We think this is the, um, the, the case because cicadas have this really interesting life cycle where they spend most of their lives below ground. They will emerge from their informal uh, mode of life. Um, often uh, they will then undertake their final molt. You can see an example of a cicada just having molted its exoskeleton here and drying its wings before taking to flight. And after emerging and doing that molt, these creatures will mate and then die within a few weeks. They do this though en masse. And we think that they do this, they have this life cycle because they have such massive numbers in this emergence event that they are less likely to go extinct. So it's just a, a way of making sure that they um, don't go extinct by having this mostly safe informal lifestyle with this, these occasional events. But let's think about those prime numbers. There are a number of different ways we can think about why these prime number systems may have developed within circadas. So these developmental times probably represent an adaptation of some kind. It could be that that's an adaptation to prevent hybridization between broods or um, or between, so between broods or between different species, right? So if you have a prime number and all of these things are working on prime, num <coughs> prime numbers, they're far, far less likely to coincide than, for example, if you have some working on two-year cycles and one, some working on four-year cycles where the two-year cycle ones will coincide with the four-year ones every other cycle, yeah? High, prime numbers help us avoid this. Could equally be, be due down to predation. So obviously when all of these cicadas appear, mate and then die, if you're a predator of cicadas, that's a good time. There's loads of food around for you. And that could be um, a really, really useful resource for you. And indeed, many of the things that we would expect to eat these creatures have two to five year life cycles. 
Um, as such, those cycles are not set by the availability of this resource. Um, but when the cycles do coincide, uh, the cicadas would actually be a really useful resource. So if we consider a predator with a life cycle of five years, if cicada, cicada sorry, emerge every 15 years, each bloom of cicadas would be hit by the predator because the predators are working on a five year life cycle. Make sense? If, in contrast, we're thinking about a cicada group that is happening every 17 years, but our predators still have a five year life cycle, um, our predator cycle will only coincide with our cicada cycle every five times 17 years. So that's every 85 years. So you're just reducing the number of um, instances where the cicada peak hits your predator peak. Either of those could be an explanation for this really interesting prime number um, pattern that we see in this group. And that's a fantastic example, I think, of temporal niche partitioning. With that, I will see you in the next video where we are going to look at, I've forgotten what we're going to look at in the next video. Uh, we're going to look at gradients in the next video. So I'll see you there in just a second.